Hi, and welcome to the third series of the Fancy A Brew podcast, talking about adventure, pushing your boundaries, and chasing dreams of underwater exploration. The podcast is supported by Dive Life Scuba Diving Centre, the one-stop shop for all your recreational and technical dive gear and training needs, hosting a five-star service and their own in-house gas blending and equipment servicing department. For more information, take a look at their website, divelife.co.uk, or on Instagram and Facebook. In this series, I'm going to be chatting to some of the divers I've met along my scuba dive adventures in the last couple of years, ranging from boat skippers, stunt performers, and underwater explorers. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, grab yourself a brew, sit back, and enjoy this week's episode. Sarah Banderby, welcome back to Fancy A Brew podcast. What brew are you drinking today? Um, I'm drinking this, yeah, (laughs) the same as last time. Thank you for for having me. It's, It's it's been almost exactly a year, I think. Yeah, last probably will. We since we recorded it, probably because I think I did them straight after Christmas, all, all my records, and they went out like every Monday morning, I yeah. think it was, for a good couple of months. So it's been a while, but obviously we speak, I wouldn't say regularly, but we speak enough, don't we? Like we're always chatting on Instagram and that. Yeah, because I was following you on your ecology tour, and I was like, oh, this is fucking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I was stalking you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think I'm more jealous of you because this, the sights that you tend to see in the mines that you're diving, I just think they just look phenomenal. But it's so far away from my diving, you know. Yeah, because just... I remember we talked. We I remember we talked about it last time, like you looking into maybe getting getting that certification or getting that training. Have you have you have you done it yet? No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, about this time last year, I trained as an HSC diver, so a health and safety executive. And oh, right. to to be a professional diver um, for like in commercial respect, you know, for media and scientific okay. training, you needed to get this, what they call a part four or professional scuba. So I was doing that. And then mm. I got quite a bit of work through the summer and, and my expedition and all, all the other things. So other qualifications went out the window for me. It was more a case of I just get loads of dives in and most of them didn't include using my JJ. So everything that you told me ah. last year pretty much went out the window. I used any of it. Oh, so we're just gonna we're just gonna do a rerun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can really you tell me how you turn it on? <laughs> how, how did you do this again? How do I really dive? <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. With it being winter here, I, I've switched to my neoprene dry suit now, so all the weighting is that I had pretty much nipped because I'd had to go onto an aluminium back plate, and I've no weight on it now. I've got to put my yeah. steel one back on. Loads of weight, so just a. It's a complete pain now because I've, I've everything I did know went completely out the window because it's winter. But it's not really winter. It's probably like spring here for you, compared to you. Yeah, for you it's it's spring right now here in the cabin. It's minus twenty one, but it's only twenty one. Yesterday was like minus thirty four, so it's yeah. very warm right now. <laughs> it's getting hotter. Oh my god. Um, yeah, but it kind of it kind of makes sense then, like because when you talk about rebuild diving, that you you have to keep it up. It's kind of like language or at least i mean yes any type of diving we have to keep it up but for the rebuilder diving it's almost even more because it's more complex one of the things i wanted to have you back on for because we talked about in august you had some problems with it didn't you oh with the machine <laughs> yeah 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 it tried to kill me no uh yeah i had the my first it's like my first my first co2 hit it's like a little uh side note in my uh, Rebuild the career, but kind of like um, it was very interesting. Uh, it was very a very enlightening experience because you in your training you you do a lot of reading about the CO two hits and the symptoms, and you're trying to be very um, aware of how how it will how it will be and how it will be feeling. <clears throat> but um, for me, I don't know. Should I should I give like context to where and and how? Yeah. And, yeah. Stuff like that, yes. So it was sometime in August, I think. I don't remember the exact date now. And um, we were diving in this mine called Longbond. It's a very, very nice mine. I can highly recommend visiting that mine. And um, I was doing, we had done one day's diving before and I had done two dives. And then I was reusing my softener line for the second, for the third dive the next day. Um, But I had about an hour left. So I was like, meh. Yeah. <laughs> we just don't do what I do. <laughs> I learned this. And uh, so we're doing the third dive because we're only doing one dive that day. And um, the, so we're in, we turn, reached our turning point and, uh, and I signaled to my body, we're going to turn around. 
And yeah. I think just after that, after I gave the turnaround signal, I maybe I sw- I, I get I get like two frog kicks in, and the first thing that hits me is this um, uh, the, the like the I have to get the fuck out of here feeling <laughs> like I'm going to no, but it's like it's so weird because one second everything is really nice and dandy, <laughs> and then the other second yeah. like I'm gonna die, and wow. then um, quickly after that I was getting this uh, nausea nausea feeling. Like, you know, you know, the feeling really like sick. when you're going to vomit. Yeah. Uh, at, at that point, I'm like, I'm go, <laughs> I'm reaching for my bail rig. Cause I'm like, oh, hell no. Um, and as I'm pulling it, like, I'm, I'm still swimming. And then I managed to get like, from the time I'm getting my regulator, I managed to get like two breaths before I bail. And in that little time window, I went from like uh, having the panicky feeling and being a bit nauseous to having the, the heat flashes. Yeah. And then um, I was getting dizzy and like my legs and arms were twitching a bit. Um, so I have this little routine of that when I, when I pull my regulator, um, I do it uh, a bit in front of me. And then I also like a tiny bit, I press on the purge button just to see the bubbles because it's, <laughs> it's nice. Yeah. Uh, and, and I just remember like I'm watching the regulator in front of me and I'm seeing the walls behind me like spin. It's like, <laughs> it's very, oh, nice. no. I'm laughing, but, but it wasn't funny that. Like no. this is my way of handling <laughs> adverse events. I I laugh at it, but I wasn't laughing then, and um, and I bail out, and it's fine. Um, and then I signal with my body. I'm like, ah, let's go home. <laughs> uh, and then we were swimming uh, all the way home, and um, oh, switching tanks because I ended up in decompression because I switched. I bailed yeah. out at 20 meters depth on like a really bad, not optimized gas. So I got. Right. Uh, a lot of deco I could have just like meh I didn't want that <laughs> so <laughs> no but it's really no but it's really like uh, it's even more stressful then because you because in that case you want to just go as quickly as up possible but yeah, then uh, you, you see the decompression clock ticking you're like no it's going the opposite uh, and then you go to the yeah we get to the 20 meter line we had the 50 percent there so I switched there and then go up and do all the decompression so all in all the event went very fine but uh, I think the the hard part was just like everything afterwards, because it kind of like hits you in the evening or the day afterwards. Like um, what the reality of it, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Because in the moment, I was very focused. Um, just all the routines and switching the bailouts and closing, like emptying the lungs and blah blah blah. And you're very focused, just like getting home. And afterwards, you were very focused on just like looking at the machine, just trying to see what went wrong. Because yeah. um, I believed it was the software line. Like I got a breakthrough of the software line. Um, and then in the evening, I was like, ah. and then you get you get all the what if scenarios, right? So <laughs> after everything happened, you start going like, yeah, but what if I haven't bailed? What if it was deeper? What if what if I didn't make it? What if blah, blah, blah. And that's th- that's the hardest part, actually, for me. Yeah. The, the the mental thingy afterwards it kind of crushed me actually i was like ah i was so insecure of everything um and even though uh even though like bear, bearing i don't know bear my heart bearing my heart out a bit even though the event went fine and you should feel like it's a validation of your skills that you yeah. that you managed for some reason it still felt like a failure that it happened yeah, I yeah because mean, it's yeah. Yeah, because it's like I should be what? happy, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm Almost like, angry. what could you have done to stop that happening before it even happened? Yes, as though you've done exactly. something wrong, but you haven't. Because if you've got if you've got run uh, not run time stack time left, it stands to reason you can dive that stack time, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. And then um, because at the time I bailed out, uh, I had ten more minutes. If we're just gonna look at three hours, like really hard. Yeah, I had ten more minutes, um, but you, <coughs> you all know that the stack time is not that accurate. It's not on the minute failure, and then no. or it could be less than three hours. All depends on the what's it called depth changes and yes, and the more and the work. If you do hard work or if you're yeah. re- relaxing, um, so yeah, that was that was very interesting for me, and that was. But at the same time, I was looking at the software line, and I was like. Um, because I know 
my metabolism of oxygen and and I was still thinking about like but just how how likely is it for me to have a soft snow line break even before three hours in 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 six degree water it's not even three hours and it wasn't even moderate work because I know yeah. what the C, 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 e. so I was I was looking at machine and then I found that my um what's it called the flapper valve on the exhaust side yeah or the exhale side exhaust uh, the exhale side was not tightening when I was uh, pulling my new breath. So I was pulling back. Um, wow. I was pulling back the the breath I just had exhaled. And when you do the over and under pressure, when you do the really hard <laughs> hard sucking and blowing, uh, <laughs> you don't notice that because you're do- applying a lot of pressure. But then if you do, if you just put your loop in and do a, like a normal, like very slow calm breath. I could feel it not tightening. I was pulling back everything. Um, so, I, so I switched it and I was like, yes, I solved it. Um, and then I've been diving after the CO2 hit and I've, ha- I've been having these, what I call mind ghosts. It's like yeah. this, um, I don't know, it's not, not PTSD, but it's like the, the first sensation of the CO2 hit, it comes to haunt you a bit. And I was getting okay. these and I was, <laughs> I was, because I'm a data scientist, I was looking at the statistics. <laughs> so I was looking through <laughs> my dives. I'm like, I'm like, okay, but one in every third dive, a third of my dives, I get this mind goes. That's quite a lot. I was like, ah, oh. because um, I knew that, or a lot of divers, because I wrote about this to it, and I, looked, I got a lot of support, and they told me like, yeah, but you should be prepared for what comes after, because usually the mental part is the hardest. A lot of people stop diving, and, and they also have these mind ghosts. And yeah. And stuff like that is so like oh shit. Um, but I was looking at it, so it's like, yeah, but one third, and I'm getting I'm getting these mind ghosts on depths and dives that are very nice, like the like clear water and shallow. I'm like, I sh- what, like I should I shouldn't I shouldn't <laughs> have these these uh, feelings. <laughs> and then I was I was doing the normal breath test again, and the exhale flapper valve that I just replaced it with also didn't work. So I replaced a bad X and flapper valve with a bad, a bad one. XA flapper. Yeah. And I, I think it might like, yeah. So it was not tightening either. I'm like, what the shit is this? Um, so I switched it again and now it's fine. Right. Um, but I don't, I don't know if it was me, if I broke, <laughs> broke the flapper valve somehow when I replaced it, mm. but in the beginning it was fine. So I've been fighting a lot with my machine, actually. Yeah. Well, one of my to questions I was going to ask you then, listening to your story, was how long after that incident was it that you got back in? I got back in basically a week after. Yeah. And because um, I, I realized, because I realized that I, I think I need to get to get back up very fast or very soon yeah. at least. So you, you don't end up with that bad feeling being the last mm. feeling you had on the machine. Uh, and I was diving another mine, um, and that was fine as well. I had to pause one time and just go like, yeah, I just need to pause here, um, collect my thoughts, and then it, it, the rest of it was fine. Then it just got progressively worse. <laughs> the more I dived, the, really? the mine goes just got, yes, it just, so I was like, no, it's going the opposite direction. Um, and then I was, and, and it kind of tears on your self-esteem a lot. To have to have those um, feelings come up pop up in your head all the time, yeah. Um, and it was getting progressively worse the more I dived. Um, and but now I think it was because of the flapper valve. Really? Yeah. Because now I when I if you're having those again, little breakthroughs back and something yeah. you think that was working correctly. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, because I was thinking about that. It's like because it's like well, when I'm working hard on the machine. On, on dives, uh, for example, when we're um, swimming a lot or stuff like that, I don't get this uh, mind ghost feelings. Yeah. But when we're doing very calm or I'm, I'm rigging lights somewhere, I could get them. And then I just realized that when, I, when I'm relaxed, I breathe very shallow. Say, yes. And then the exhale flapper doesn't close. But when I work hard and I, and I breathe harder, it closes. Right. So that kind of made, made sense for me. Well, that, that's given me an idea. So when I'm building my machine and I'll hold the loop and I'll do like a, a breath test yeah. through it to see if 
the exhaust and inhale valves actually do what they should do. I'd probably go blowing it dead hard and then sucking it dead hard. But if yeah, if that's well, always going to work that way, do it maybe a little well, bit it, gentle. Well, it's a good yeah. Well, it's a good test to do first because then if, if there is something broken, like if there's a hole in the flapper valve or you got something stuck in it, you you will notice it. You will notice it mm. quite fast when you do those tests. But then you could also do. And it's funny because I told my dive buddies this and they've also started doing this test. So it's really funny. You just put the loop in your mouth. This is what I do. And I just put the loop in my mouth and I just breathe regularly and calmly like I would do. And I place my hands under each um, loop so yeah. I can feel also if the sure. air is sucking or blowing. Yes, when I'm just yeah. breathing normally. So I, I do both things when I test okay. the loop now because... <laughs> So I don't get any unpleasant surprises. And I know yeah. I know there's a lot of divers who already do this. Um, mm. I just have to be more careful about it, I guess. Yeah, I think that's probably something that, that's come from the kind of diving I haven't been doing. I've not been as vigilant as perhaps I could be or should be now. So I've never done that test where I've had it in my mouth and held either end. I've always just blown in either end of the hose. So that's something I'll pick up. But because I'm not diving it regularly enough, I look at the steps in my checklist and perhaps I'm not as vigilant on each one as I could be. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I kind of like <laughs> hashtag relate because <laughs> I think because I've been ever since the T2 it, I've been like looking at a lot of my diving, just looking back. Yeah. And uh, being a bit more self-critical on a lot of dives I have done. Yeah. Um, both in terms of preparation <clears throat> or the way I've executed the dives. Um, so I, I don't know how to say, I, be, I become more, not self-critical, because I was always criticizing myself, but, but yeah. more aware maybe, or I more guess. skeptical towards certain things. Um, and then just looking back on some dives going, yeah, maybe I was a bit overconfident here <laughs> maybe i was a bit overconfident there so I, I call it like get maybe getting a little bit of a slap of reality um and just yeah i'll be have yeah i've been looking back on a lot of dives and just go like yeah i i wouldn't i wouldn't do it that that way today now I've so heard, i try to i was gonna yeah. say i've heard the phrase the normalization of deviance so you become it's it's a normal thing to do to just not be as precise as you could be and yeah. you know really target those areas that you can make a mistake but because it didn't happen last time it's it's okay to do it again because nothing happened nobody died so let's just be not as specific or as precise on the next time we do it and then because you didn't die on that one you perhaps become a little yeah. bit more laps or you know you, you're not doing it as, as well as you <clears> could do and really with this kind of diving certainly with me because i I don't really dive with any other rebreather divers. They're all open circuit, so they're ready to get in the water. And I'm still doing my pre-breather something and feeling that I'm holding them up. So perhaps I need to rush. So I'll do four minutes instead of five, perhaps. I'm not saying I do, but you know, you, you tend to rush mm. rather than, listen, I'm going to be 10 minutes. If you want to go and get in the water and start getting ready, I'll see you in there. I'll be like trying to rush to keep up with them. And it's quite dangerous in it, <laughs> in the kind of diving we're doing. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And and I think also that because you can't really, it's it's all on you anyways. Either way you go, if you're going to do it properly or you're going to be sloppy about it, the only one you can blame is yourself. Um, yeah. And I think that's why I was so angry <laughs> after my after my CO2 hit, like, why? And it's like, you know why. Uh, you were being sloppy. Um, so I've been just kind of like critically looking a lot on a lot of things I've been doing um and just trying to share my experience to my fellow divers as well so because if anything if there's something i've been doing that's that's really bad um and others are doing it as well and then i can just be like yeah but this happened to me so maybe not because i think i think that that's the one of the things that you you don't take stuff maybe so seriously because it doesn't happen to you yet like you get yeah. another kind of connection to it and then i've also been uh, just more alert, I think. Yeah. When I dive, more alert. Maybe not as relaxed anymore. Hmm. I found that so, in very, very much in a lot of my early dives after training, 
where I was diving with other people that wouldn't know what was going on. I was on this hyper alert, so sort of hypersensitive. So anything that didn't feel like it did a second ago, I'm like, oh, I'm going to die. Something's up. What's wrong? Looking at all my readings and 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 thinking, what's up here? What has yeah. happened that I just don't feel well or don't feel right? And it was probably nothing. I think it's just because you you put yourself on this hypersensitive, hyper alert phase and then because nothing happened you then become a little bit easier to dive the next time yeah. and, and then before you know it you, you're so lax you forgot to turn your computer on or something yeah exactly and, and it's really like so when you're new on the rebreather um and any model and actually mm. and it, it, everything is new everything feels very weird is a new sensation and so as you progress and you dive you build up some kind of a internal reference frame for yourself of how the rebreather is feeling, how you are feeling on the machine, like, you know, all the sounds and experiences and how, you know, buoyancy and all that. And so, and I've talked to other people I know who've had this year to it and they, they feel the same. So you, you spend a lot of time building this weird solid foundation of how your rebreather dive and how yeah. it feels. And then you get to see it do it. Um, so it, so for me, it went from a lot of like, I almost had, I had, I think like 250 hours or something before the CO2 hit, where I am, I'm very confident in how I know my breather machine feels. And we've also always been taught that, you know, if something feels wrong, just bail out, just like when in doubt, bail out and be very alert. And then after the CO2 hit, I went from like the reference frames have been like shattered because every a third of the dyes I've had after that have felt really bad. Yeah. So I, I've gone from being alert of how how it's not supposed to feel <laughs> to having a lot of bad feelings when I dive and just mm -hmm. have to tell myself, no, it's not the machine, it's you. So I went from <laughs> yeah. like always, you, you understand what I mean? Like, so, yeah, yeah. so I've been struggling a lot with like having to rebuild my reference frame of how yeah. it's supposed, like getting the confidence back on the machine. So I remember some of the earlier dives I did after the, the CO2 hit, where I was diving this wreck called Para. She's on like 60 meters depth. And I was down there and I was not feeling very happy at all. I was not very comfortable. <laughs> and and, and uh, I was having these, you know, tiny, tiny terror attacks after say. And, and at the end I was like, what the fuck am I doing down here? Why am I down here? Yeah. Nothing feels nice. So I was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm going up. And then, yeah, the decompression was horrible because it was a lot of waves and I was just lying there feeling oh, really sick, sick and horrible. Yeah, so so basically what I've been doing after that is just um, like, kind of like redoing, redoing my mod one, like just going from shallower to deeper, yeah. but like slowly. And then redoing a lot of the skills just just to get the, just to get confidence back. But it's taken a, it's taken a while for yeah. sure. Well, not long after that, then we were both in Scapa Flow roughly at the same time. Yes. So you must have got over enough of these demons because, from what I remember, you really enjoyed it, didn't you? It was like one of your yeah, bucket I, list I, ticks. Yes. So uh, before that, uh, before that trip, we did what uh, uh, a huge checkup dive where we just redid all the skills. Um, because I was like, yeah, but nothing's gonna ruin <laughs> Scapa <laughs> for me because I remember last time we talked, we were discussing that as well. And um, we were like, yeah, maybe we will make it. We shall see. <laughs> because Corona was also at that point. Yeah. And uh, we finally went. And it was absolutely the trip of my dreams. For sure. Really? And yeah, and absolutely worth all the goddamn PCR tests I had to pay for. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot of money in PCR tests. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was amazing. It was me, uh, my buddy Magnus, and then Tobbe. Uh, and Tote, who, who went there. You had, um, I'm so jealous because you had such better viz than we had. We were, I think it was only a week apart. You were leaving as we were getting yeah. there. And your viz was like somewhere, you know, in like the South Pacific or something, you know, or mid Atlantic, I don't know, just somewhere dead clear. And then we went and it was just horrendous because the weather had changed. It was dead windy, oh, no. it was raining all the time. And whilst I could see what I wanted to see, it wasn't the viz that I'd seen on your photographs. I was like, oh, no. how can it so be a week apart? It. It, was it was devastating. <laughs> oh, no, so I ruined it for you because it went in yeah. with my expectations. Yeah, so um, that, the, 
it was really funny because uh, a guy in the dive group, because I was I went I was diving with a BSAC club, links yeah. divers. So uh, Sam Sam Room he had managed for us to get some spots, and he had been there two weeks prior to us. Really, and he was also on our trip, so he told us that. Well, you shouldn't get high expectations. I was here two weeks ago. It was two, three meter visibility. Wow. And I was like, I was bummed out. I was like, yeah, yeah, but we're here now and we're here for the wrecks. So two, three meters is still enough just to see what we want to say. Like we'll just make the best of it because it's kind of like yeah. standard Baltic Sea visibility. <laughs> um, so we're going down on the first wreck. I think it was the, the Dresden. And on the way down on the line, I'm like, can I can already see the wreck? Yeah, <laughs> didn't. Um, I was like, didn't Sam say like two meters? And it was um, unbelievable. We had like fifteen meters, and then we had the calls through. Uh, was that like twenty meters? <laughs> and I and I just came up. I was like, Sam, you liar! Um, <laughs> but I was, uh, <laughs> but I was, I was pleased. I was pleasantly surprised because I was expecting yeah. the worst. Um, I don't know why we had some good visibility. I don't know. It was just like the visibility gods were with us and there was no, um, we did have a bit of rain, but nothing really horrible. I don't know if some current went the right way or something, uh, but it was absolutely amazing. And afterwards, I'm really happy because those wrecks are so huge. Mm. Like it would have taken so much time to, with two, three meter visibility to see all the way we got to see. Yeah, um, tell me about it. <laughs> That's exactly what we had. <laughs> I know. I, I feel so bad for you, Eddie. And and because I had uh, other friends who were also going after after me, but on the other boats, and they were like yeah. expecting this amazing visibility, and they were so disappointed. I'm like, I'm so sorry, you guys. <laughs> I I raised expectations, but it was um, yeah, it was amazing. We were doing uh, roughly between ninety to two ninety minutes to two hour dives because. The, I mean, it was quite warm. It's like 13 degrees in the water. Mm. Um, I wasn't cold. Was I was glorious. definitely, I definitely enjoyed the dive for that aspect. You know, I hate being cold. There's nothing worse, especially when you sat on the line for 15, 20 minutes and you're like, I need to get upstairs because it's flipping freezing in here. It wasn't that at all. It was just on that cusp of winter. Well, the late autumn was coming in and the temperatures had start to drop, but it, it wasn't at all that bad. It was just the visibility was just the... Yeah. Yeah, oh. I know. I'm sorry. It was fun though. I, I I made a video while I was there. That was like one of my things to do. And I've got. Yeah. I think I think Ali, my wife, was videoing us getting. It was one of the dives she didn't want to do. And there was two guys with us um, that were diving it. Um, the AP Inspiration, and they were stood in the gate ready to come. And this wave came in and just smashed him in the face off the side <laughs> of the boat. And I'm like, I can't wait to get in here. This is the most exciting diving I've ever done. Just getting in. Uh, so it was fun, but you can see from the video that I put on YouTube that the viz was just, it just looks like we're diving on a scrap heap that's got flooded because you can't really make out much of what, what was in there whilst it was still fun because, you know, it was where we were and I was with one of my best mates and my wife. The the lads on yeah. that were on the boat made that trip even better because they were all superb divers that wanted to share their experience. Some had uh, dived the Britannic and other really oh, wow. deep wrecks, you know, so they'd had this foresight that we could help me become a better diver. And a lot of them were on JJ's as well. So you, you can imagine what I was like. I was like a kid in a sweet shop. Why have you done this? How did you do that? And I learned yeah. so much, I think, from that, but not really dived that's again re since. That's re yeah, but that's a really good thing because uh, I also do that as well. I always, and not even, it doesn't have to be even be a JJ. I always look on, like <laughs> when I see someone new on the diving platform and they have some, and they have a machine with them. Like I, I always like Google their machines or Argle, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, yeah. And just see, not in the way, not in a critical way, but I just want to look and see if they have any tips or tricks that they have done to the machine that they don't teach you on courses. And especially like if there are people who are much more experienced than me, I always take a look on their gear and I also look yeah. at them how they are diving. Because I don't know, some people, I'm the kind of person who, you know, learn a lot about just looking like visually. On how they yeah. do so i'm really happy to to hear that you were <laughs> talking to them and looking on on them because that's that's really nice but your your wife she doesn't she doesn't agree that no she's twin set um we we yeah, damn learned, it. yeah we started <laughs> at, at the same time with the same club and we got to be sac sport diver together and i just had the opportunity through being in the army at the time 
to go away a lot more regularly. So I was doing like back to back two weeks away on expeditions and just progressing through the BSAC syllabus up to advanced diver. Then, because I was super keen, I wanted to run my own expedition, but I needed to be an instructor for that. So they put me on that course and then I became a supervisor. And it just, so there was a, like a, a really quick but natural progression. And mm. if you look through the BSAC syllabus, when you get to sport diver, you can dive to 35 meters on nitrox with no decompression. She put a twin set on her back, was happy with that. And that's the kind of diving she likes doing anything deeper where it's darker and you've got to hang around. You can't just come out the water. It's not her kind of diving. She wants to see lots of, you know, marine life and, and enjoy it for what it is and just get out. Whereas me, a bit like you, I'm a gearhead. I have to have loads of kit and equipment. I mean, if I turn my camera around, the amount of cameras and stuff I've got on, on my shelf here and <laughs> just bits of stuff that I'll never use, but I keep buying stuff because I love it. You know, that's, I guess, you know, that's probably my downfall. Whereas she goes in and just enjoys the dive. I've got to spend three weeks prepping for that dive because I've got so much stuff that <laughs> I want to use and remember how to use it when I get there. So whilst we enjoy the same kind of diving, I, I just like taking loads of stuff with me <laughs> that I don't know how to use. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can I can uh, <laughs> can relate to that and and like if for for people who are listening who haven't who haven't gotten the machine yet, you're like when when you buy the rebreather, it kind of like breaks the relativity of money. So before you get yeah. the rebreather, you're like, ooh, a dive computer, ooh, ooh, a couple of fiends, ooh. But after rebreather, you're like, you're like four eighty cuff stages, no problem. They're, they're, because suddenly <laughs> suddenly because you know the machine is so expensive, so suddenly everything yeah. relative to that is just like. Oh, it's only a couple of thousands. Pfft, no problem. And and suddenly you're like, wow, my wallet's so empty. <laughs> because you've broken that relativity. It's like, yeah. but, but some things I've gotten cheaper. Like, because one of the things that's really nice about real diving is the gas logistics, right? It's with the tiny yeah. bottles. And <laughs> and then I'm, but like gas wise, I've gotten really cheap. I'm like, 50 euros for a 1550 daily rent. This is outrageous. Oh. Well, how are you charging me? <laughs> so any, if anything else, I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'm like that meme, you know, when you're just throwing the, the money. Yeah. But when it comes to, to like gas bills, I'm like, no, I need to see your calculations. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Do you always use helium? Um, <clears throat> yeah, kind of. It, be, it becomes that way because I usually like just top up with air if right. I if I need to fill it and not doing so so like yeah. I can have everything from like really <laughs> I don't know with the, the word just the term stroke stroke mix like yeah. I have like 20 slash <laughs> five or something like right, that yeah. and we have we have like this we call we have in, in my dive group or how to say we have we have like three terms we call it a cozy mix which is what you have when you top up a 1550 so you get yeah. like 17 25 or something like that so it's perfect for like sub 35 meter dives like 40 meter dives and then yeah. you have the 15 50 that we do and then we have the 10 70 and stuff like that so right so yeah but because there's the, the cost is so there's so little the only thing that kind of hurt hurts is is, is because the dive computer gives you more decompression when you're on helium yeah and so i try to use as little, little, little as, as possible yeah within the reference frames of like the end that i want to have and the gas density and blah 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 mm. but i'm not i'm not using a 1070 on the 15 meter dives because that's just uh, Nuts. yeah well yeah, I, I, but... while we were there i had the opportunity to have like is it, it's called helotrox isn't it so you just diluting you dill down just a little bit to reduce the gas density because it was one of the deeper dives, the 3540s, I forget which one mm. it was. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. We had the discussion about isobaric counter diffusion or something like that was the term we were trying to use. Yeah, it. depending on how deep you dive because of the, if you look at how much the, the pressure increases depending on depth, you, like you know how the biggest changes are yeah. in the shallowest. Yeah. And then the deeper as you progress, the, the the relativity against each other becomes smaller. So for me, the way I ascend, it's not uh, it's not just like one rate. So the deeper I am, the faster I go, and as I go go shallower and shallower, I start to go slower and slower. Literally walking your fingers up the line like that. 
Yeah, well, not even well, not even the line. It's just yeah. you just go the first. The first. <laughs> if you no, but it's like if you if you're if you're at eighty meters, in that sense, I can I can ascend very fast to yeah. to sixty or fifty because the pressure changes there is not that big compared to if you go from from fifty to thirty or from thirty to ten. Yeah. So the the rate changes and. But also you have to you have to keep a track on on your on your partial pressure of oxygen if you're doing like really fast ascensions. Mm. It all depends. I don't do deep stops or how to say like this is this is yeah, one of the, I mean, the hot potatoes. You don't yeah. <laughs> you don't want to discuss and touch like deep stops or not deep stops. Um, I tend to lean towards more um, shallower stops, but I do them longer um, than than doing deep stops. So I don't I don't start like if I've been on to eighty meters, seventy meters. I don't I don't do my first stops at 50 depending on how long i've been down of course is is a factor yeah. of that well, yeah well, we worked through that, that on the boat they were saying they were talking about this ascent rate and how quickly i should or shouldn't move so we did it anyway and when i come out they're all like so did you enjoy it did it did it feel any different i was like nope <laughs> it's just the same <laughs> <laughs> they're like so you've just paid 18 quid for a uh for a fill or for a dill mix and you didn't notice any different i'm like no <laughs> How much helium videos. did you get? Uh, How I much helium did you have in your helium? Where's my logbook? It must be here somewhere. Yes, pull out that analog logbook. I have the same. I write everything down analog. Uh, hang on. <laughs> here we go. Let's see. Yes. What did you have? Oh God. I'm curious now. Oh, it's right at the back. I finished this. Logbook. Show me your calculations. <laughs> <laughs> I had calculations. Yeah, do you, do you also write down a lot of things like what that happened during the dive in your logbook? No, do you want to see? Do you want to see my logbook? <laughs> it's the name of the dive, <laughs> and then how uh, long was it? That is it. Oh my god! Every every dive I have is like a novel. Oh. <laughs> I write down everything, like how I felt. I haven't done it. <laughs> what I if, saw. If I, I had my computer, here, I'd be able to tell you. I can run and get it, but it'll take me ten minutes to find it in my garage. But uh -huh. it was it was only a very very sort of light mix. I, I, off the yeah. top of my head, I'd be like, I'd sound like a fool if I even tried to say it. So I probably better not do it. <laughs> no, I mean it depends on how much helium you have. I've, yeah. Uh, like, it, it, and I I think like a lot of people, <clears throat> or at least for me, because um, everyone reacts to like nitrogen or causes differently. I I know yeah. how I get. I get like a little buzzy and I get very overconfident. Uh, I, I have done 40 meters dives on my machine on air, but it's very buzz buzz. And yeah. I'm not, I don't really like it because it's like you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't drive your car drunk. So why would you dive the machine yeah. like narked? I get you. But I've never, I, but I've ne nobody's ever put it to me like that before, you know, I've never thought of it like that. Huh? But, but equally, <laughs> I, I've never felt narked i know they say you're always going to be narked at a certain depth but you just don't realize it because there's different levels um, and ali my wife she feels it quite quickly and it it worries her so she she'll ascend mm -hmm. a little bit and hang around at that point for a while before yeah. she's confident enough to come down but i don't maybe because i'm so full of bravado and i'm just like oh, i'll be all right with a lot of <laughs> being <things>. a macho <laughs> man <laughs> <laughs> stupidly yeah foolishly but i've never knowingly felt that Mm -hmm. so maybe I, I can i can feel it right. yeah because i can be i can be um on the surface i can be like your wife she's like oh i don't know if i want to dive that deep on air and then while i'm done there i'm like yeah let's go deeper and they were like but you said you weren't gonna i'm like it's the narco this nitrogen it's, it's yeah. not me um so that's why i i like to have helium because i don't i don't tr i don't trust myself so much when okay. i'm marked to do good decisions right. um so i usually have a, a bit of helium yeah all the time yeah mm -hmm. um but so, for, i don't know how your wife feels but i have this funny thing i don't know if you felt it, it uh, i felt it when i was diving the rebreather uh, on 40 meters on air but it's almost i can have this weird sensation of like the tongue feeling like it's numb we mm -hmm. have that that's how oh. i that's how i know i'm really not because i have that sensation i was doing yeah. i was i was in akaba last year in march or no two years ago i think and i was doing because it didn't have the helium there was ridiculously expensive and we were, we were diving oc 
I was doing yeah. like 55 meter dives on <laughs> on oh air. Oh my god! I was so out of it. Like I, really? the, <laughs> the only reason I I I have to look at the pictures afterwards. Like, oh, this is how the wreck looked like. This is fucking amazing. Oh, I must have enjoyed it so much. <laughs> and then at the 15 meter stop, when we had been there for quite a while on the 50 percent, that's when I would like. I was like, oh, I'm back. Because <laughs> it feels like you're hung over yeah. on the line. Wow. That was ridiculous. Just quickly going to interrupt this interview for a word about our sponsors. So the Fancy A Brew podcast is supported by Dive Life Scuba Diving Centre, your one-stop shop for all the recreational and technical dive gear and training needs based out of the UK. They boast a five-star service with their own in-house gas blending and equipment servicing department. Not only do they have the biggest well-known brands such as Halcyon, Santi, X-Deep and Fourth Element, but they're also helping to promote new and up-and-coming brands reach their full potential. With a long-standing instructional career, Oli Van Overbeek has developed a community of divers through his store's club memberships offering fantastic discounts on trips and training and equipment. The team at Dive Life teaches everything from open water to advanced Trimix rebreather courses. Or even if you want to become an instructor, no matter what your diving aim, they can help. So for more information, take a look at their website, divelife.co.uk, or find them on Instagram and Facebook. And for a 10% discount on internet sales, use promotional code ATND10 at the checkout. Unfortunately, this isn't usable on any already discounted products. So next time that you're looking around for training or kit, give Dive Life a click. And now let's get back onto this episode. Who was your yeah. photographer then in, when you were in Scapa? Um, it was Tobbe, uh, Torbjörn Julius is, is his name. Um, yeah. So it was really fun because we had we had a cancellation of one of the, we call the Swedish crew <laughs> when we got there. Yeah. And one of the guys had to cancel. And we were like, oh shit, but we have one, one set, uh, spot left. So we were we asked him and he could, like, we really two weeks short notice really um come with us. And it was it was really nice of him to take a lot of photos. And he did that um article about our trip. We were with uh, Huskian yeah. uh, and Emily and her crew, uh, uh, Duncan and Nick, and they were it was really amazing. It was it was really I've, funny. I've not and met I remember... them. I've I've not met them, but I've seen the boat, <clears throat> excuse me. But it's been purpose built, hasn't it? That like yes, she designed and it all it, and stuff. It, yeah, and it's it you it it just shows. It just shows the moment you step on the boat, it's it just optimized for diving completely. So um before you go into like the kitchen and the warm room areas, so you have like this sheltered wet area where the dry suits are hanging. You can you have the camera benches and you have a shower, you can shower off the, the camera equipment, and it's just everything was very smooth on the boat. And I'm I'm always very skeptical to new diving boats I haven't been on because you don't know yeah. their routines and everything like that. Um, and it was just perfect. The, the mm. way she had set it up with the numbered benches and everything and like, you know, not placing diving pairs next to each other, but like, um, how to say, whatever. yeah, exactly. So every, it was really smooth just getting in and out of the boat. Um, and I, you know, in Sweden, we don't, we don't have any boats that have a dive elevator. So, of course, we were very excited <laughs> to be riding the, the elevators up. Um, and we did have one day, just like you guys, where there was a lot of wind and there was uh, bigger waves. And I, I was a bit skeptical as well. I was like, ah, so we're going to dive the gun turrets. Yeah. Um, and I was like, ah, I don't know. I, uh, maybe I should sit this one out because the, the waves are quite high. Um and, but Emily, she's she's a really amazing skipper, and she she gave us her strategy of how she's gonna pick us up. Um, and I was like, okay, but let's, let's do this, and we had like a really nice dive, and then we got up, and it was so ridiculously smooth the way she picked us up in those high waves. I was I was blown away. Uh, yeah, literally, literally blown away. I was a, literally <laughs> blown away. She raised me up, and and I was just uh, it was just amazing. Yeah. Um. I. Uh, yeah. So I was. I was really impressed. Um. Yeah. I just even still thinking about it. I'm just like, ah. Oh, I'll have to go back. <laughs> I remember diving more. them when I dived them gun turrets, and there's like a cave line, isn't there, between the two? Yeah. And I'm. Yeah. I was on my own. My buddy Steve is an absolute nightmare. He, he. You need to watch him. He doesn't watch you. So if you if you for uh -huh. one second aren't watching him, he's just gone. He's 
So I've learned that now that I'll just carry on the dive because he's not, he'll come and find me eventually. So I thought, <laughs> I'm going to see this other gun turret. So I'll follow this line and the visibility was so poor. We had a few divers that were like kicking all the sediment up because it's quite close to the bottom of that line as well, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So I was yes. following it, trying not to touch it, trying to just be nice and precise with how I was getting across so I wasn't kicking up any of the, the silt and that. And I'm thinking, this is going on a long, long way here. It probably wasn't. I bet it was only 10 metres. But 10 metres <laughs> felt like 100 metres. And I'm like, is anything there? There was no lights. I couldn't see anybody or anything. Eventually found it. And I'm like, got hold of it, hugged it. Yeah, I'm safe now. But is there a shot line on it? <laughs> Can I get back up on this? Am I safe? And eventually, I had a tap on my shoulder. It was Steve. He'd followed me. He was just behind me. And I couldn't see him. You know, every time yeah. you look around, he'd gone the other side. So he's a flipping nightmare, Steve. But good guy. God damn it, Steve. Are you leaving <laughs> And he just, yeah, but I mean, if you have a go at him, he just laughs it off. He's just, oh, it's okay. I knew where you were. I'm like, but I don't know where you are. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know the feeling. Um, yeah, but the, we were also following that line. And it, it, it is, it's more than 10 meters for sure. And we had a bit of a current when we we're there. And one of the yeah. crew members were also diving and he had this tiny little scooter. And at first, <clears throat> And I was just looking at me, I'm like, man, I should just punch him and steal his scooter because <laughs> the swim back was against the current. Yeah. Uh, it was, a, it was a, that, at that point, it was a bit hard. But um, otherwise, the current current situation in Scapa wasn't that bad. Hmm. At most part, it was just like a comfortable breeze to to yeah. follow along. But it was it was very nice. And, and I remember like we were sitting there because Emily, she has like these amazing dive briefings of the of the rex um where she she combines photography with the 3d modeling and you know the dive paths and what to see and whatnot wow. and at first i was like <laughs> and at first i was like really cocky i was like i don't need no dive briefing i'm a wreck diver i can do this myself <laughs> but i was listening anyways yeah I, you know it's so stupid and then when it came down on the wreck i was like oh i'm so happy i listened to that dive briefing. yeah <laughs> even with that good visibility like the, the wrecks are huge and and so uh, many of them are like either completely upside down or laying with their bar they're like yeah on the side the hull, yeah in the hull upward and uh, and then when you swim along the hull you're like did i did i miss the line and did i like i've been swinging along this hull for ages like <laughs> yeah <laughs> where am i <laughs> And yeah, so it was really good. And 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 then I understand it because we were on the breather. So we do we we have time if we fuck up and we take the wrong way. We could just like meh and just go the other way. But if you're on OC, then the clock is ticking because a lot of the things that you wanted to see were at 25 to 30 meters. And then yeah. um if you're diving a single tank, then you kind of wanna you wanna see something very specific. You have to you have to have that path down mm. directly, at least on some of the some of the wrecks. So, yeah, no, it was uh, it was amazing, and Orkney is a beautiful island. It's just completely amazing. We because of the weather and the time we were getting back and the the lateness of the year, it was so it was almost dark by the time we'd finished doing our admin to get off and go and explore. But obviously, having worked there in the summer and been there again visiting, I had the chance to see a lot of the island. We did go over to the museum. We parked up near the museum for lunch one day, but it was sh shut all year. I think they've just finished refurbing it and, and stuff like that. So we'd, we'd seen a bit, but didn't really get enough of the island. But it's a beautiful place. It's just a long, long drive for us, about 10 hours. How do you, do you get, do you come over? Do you fly over? Or do you get the ferry over? Yeah, we, we, we flew over because we were looking at the ferry option first, but yeah. there used to be a car ferry, but it doesn't go anymore because I think it used to go between Norway and Aberdeen and right. it doesn't anymore. It was like right. this, uh, it was a, an actual, I think it was a cargo ferry that sometimes if they had space over could take cars. Right. So we flew, we flew to Aberdeen and then we took, uh, we just rented a car and we drove from there. Tobbe and Totte, they flew to Edinburgh and then drove from there. Right. And um, yeah, uh, so me and Magnus, we took extra days just to visit the Orkney Islands and just see the nice. sightseeing. And we took an extra day in Inverness and everything like that. So it was, it was very nice. Wicked. Uh, so it was I've, really funny. I've got to mention. I've got to mention that you got on the front cover of this magazine. Now, it looks <laughs> to me like it's called Dick. <laughs> Dick. 
And I know it's, it's more like Dirk, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's, so... it's, it's, it's really it's called pronounced Dirk. It's just like dive.net or dirk.net. Yeah. But uh, yeah, this is, it's a dick magazine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the front cover. Um, hey. Yeah, the, yeah, that picture I, I really I really enjoy it because I'm, a, I'm on the on the top of the bottom of the of the hull and that that uh, thing is so deep or uh, like it's so high so where i'm at it's like if i look down it's like the 10 meters more yeah it's, what wreck was it yeah, now? Just, I think. sorry what wreck was it i think that is i think that one is the mark graph because it's completely turned upside down is that the one with the two big rudders at the back uh, obviously at the back it's not yeah really it's the, the one with the, the gun run did you do the gun run I probably did, but I was probably knocked and trying to in denial of being yeah, knocked, so I don't remember any of it. Shame! You pay all that money to dive these awesome wrecks. You don't the Mark Graph's definitely got two big rudders at the back. I'm sure it has. Yeah, I mean, like they're ships. The... All of them have rudders. <laughs> Shut up! You know what I mean? It's like one of those iconic <laughs> photographs. You know, you want to be between the two rudders and get yeah, a photograph yeah, yeah. of that. I'm sure that's the one. <laughs> did, yeah. did you have a Do you have a good big write up in that magazine then? Yeah, so it's it's Tobbe and uh, Tobbe who's done all the photography and he wrote an article about like diving diving scapa and about the wrecks and and the yeah. husky and the boat. So it was it was really nice. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm really happy to have like I've done my bucket list, uh, one of my bucket list dives, and I also yeah. had the pleasure of him joining on me joining us on the trip. So it's been I don't know how to say. Yeah, there's like really nice photos. Not just my shitty GoPro shaky <laughs> <laughs> camera footage with, with me trying yeah. to sh chase away all the fucking fish that's in the way. Like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to film the bomb railway yeah. on the Brummer and it's just like this waterfall of fishes that is just like coming from over the top of the hull and just like raining down on in between me and the... Bomb railway. In some ways, it's not good to have a rebreather because the bubbles would have probably chased him away, but yeah. they were getting super close. So I was like, get away. Of the um, hardship of modern divers, there's too many fish, eh? That's hard. Yeah, I know. It's I'm so spoiled. Like, oh my god, there's so much fish. <laughs> <laughs> but and then we had like um it was really funny because we had seals. Um yeah. join us on one. some Ali, other. Ali saw one on like almost every day, whether it be on the dive or on the surface. I didn't see one, not one. Ah, uh, we, we saw we saw a lot. Uh, like we saw a really fat one at the gun turrets, um, and then there was this uh, really awesome encounter where I was on the way up on the shop line, and there's there's another dive team from another boat was going down, and this guy is like, he just I think he's, he's diving. Like if he if he hears this, like the, the dude with the black D12s with the, with the skulls on it, he's swimming around along the hull. He's just gotten down. And this seal is swimming right fucking behind him and it's nibbling his fins and he doesn't notice anything. And he no was way. doing it for like a really long time. I'm like, <laughs> I was like, this guy is missing out so much. <laughs> and the seal was just following him, yeah. but always right behind him. He didn't notice anything. It was amazing. I, I wish I had been faster getting my GoPro camera up and filmed it. It was amazing. Imagine and if then, you'd had got footage of that. And and somehow this guy who remains nameless for the minute sees the footage and he's like, "No way, that's me," <laughs> and had yeah. no idea that that happened. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know which dive boat it was, but he was diving there the same week as me. So if yeah. he hears this, you you were absolutely like stalked by a, a seal. You missed um, out, mate. <laughs> yeah, you missed out. And then uh, at the <laughs> and then it was really funny because you had this. <clears throat> for me, it was very new these diving birds we're swimming along one oh, of the wrecks we got, like what are they called? i don't remember i'm like i'm um, just calling the diving birds <laughs> they look like penguins um, but with bigger wings don't they yeah i was i was just like i'm not an ornithologist i'm like it's a bird and, then, and we were swimming <laughs> along some wreck and we're at 35 meters and i, I, just, I catch something and the side of my eye i'm like i'm like there's a fucking bird down here and it's not just like going up and down. It's like actually swimming along the bottom. I'm like, this is some, this is some hardcore free diving shit right here. And, <laughs> and then it just goes up again. And so we're at the gun turrets and we were doing our decompression stop. And oh, I, yeah. I have witnesses on this. One of the crew members, Nick, saw this. 
and we're laying by the line and then there's one of these uh, swimming birds swimming along we were at like five or six meters and this bird has the audacity to attack me it starts no. biting my hands <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if just if you just took a look on all of the divers, it's like that that girl right there, she's the tiniest one. I can take her. And <laughs> it just attacked me. It was hilarious. Oh, for Pinnack. I'm just trying to have a look now, see what they call that, because I'd know it straight away. I mean, I've dived with gannets. Have you ever seen a gannet dive? No. They're much bigger. And they, they hit the water at about 200 miles an hour, but um, no, I can't see him. I can't spend too long having a, you know, Googling him, but. Which birds die for fish? <laughs> yes, this, this is a good podcast. We just listen yeah. to the silence when you go and shit. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember what they're called. Oh, well, it'll play. I'll, I'll probably find out after and I'll, 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 I'll write in the description this is what bird it was. But we saw loads of them and I, <laughs> yeah. I knew it wasn't a penguin, but they're the sort of penguin shape, but we're more of a beak, aren't they? And yeah. the wings sort of, but they just flap around. It's like, how can you move yeah, so fast underwater and, and not seemingly chasing anything? There's nothing there. <laughs> Yeah. So um, yeah, you've developed with uh, Joanna Rybeck, haven't you? And oh. who's the other girl? Down there. Yeah, you've developed this um, the cavettes. <laughs> yeah, it's really funny because <laughs> we were we were like <clears throat> we we've, we've known each other for quite a while, quite a while on Instagram, I have to say, social media, and yeah. uh, we've been talking a lot and um, just incur and then at some point someone was like, yeah, should we just should we just dive together? Maybe <laughs> we were like, fuck yeah. Um, because there are a lot of like in, in Sweden, it's it's there, there are a lot of women who are mine diving or cave diving with repeaters, but we 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 don't time when we're at the mine. So usually it's just one of us really? <laughs> taking turns. So I was like, oh yeah. So I was like, yeah, it would be really nice to die with more women. Um, because yeah, so we just started this thing we call the KVS, and the first trick was to to the hesmat. And um, just diving together, have fun. And of course, it's not just for women. Like the, the everyone who brought like their male buddies and stuff like that. Um, yeah. We're having a <laughs> we're having a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, so it was just for us. It was a lot about just um, meeting others, like sharing experiences, encouragement, like getting to know each other and learning and and have fun. Because yeah. um, there are some things that. Yeah, maybe I can't really discuss with my male buddies. Like I can't get tips on how to apply the sheathy from my male buddies and stuff like that. The, the, yeah. yeah, or like boob squeeze or whatever. It's like there's <laughs> they can't relate to some of the struggles. I think um, some men can relate to boob squeeze though, because some of them have got bigger <laughs> boobs than most. Some of the blokes I've um, seen diving. Wow. Yeah, yeah, but that's that's maybe that's maybe boob squeeze. I don't know. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> not the same um but yeah so 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 we had a lot of fun and it was really funny because we, we were like oh yeah should we should we like call ourselves something or like because everybody knows when you start a project you have to have a cool name and a cool logo that's like <laughs> that's like yeah. the first thing you do and we're like yeah but what about the k um because i was because I, I was thinking about like you know how to name yourself women or or girl or blah blah blah. I'm like, no, nah, but it's it's a bit boring actually. So Kevet. Mm. And it's really funny because in in French, Kevet means to be like naive. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, fucking, I love it. <laughs> and then and then it's like our our logo is just like, oh I don't know if you've seen it. It's like this, <laughs> it's like this C that has a little hole and it's like a line with an arrow. And I was like, I just love the fact that the main letter is a C because it could also stand for cunt and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. So, we we run around and call each other cunts all the time. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but it, but it's funny. We have to <laughs> reclaim reclaim the cunt word. Um, oh, yeah, but we so we were at the Hesperi, and that was the first time we actually met in person, and it, we had a we had a lot of fun. And Maria from uh, Baller up from Denmark also joined us. Um, it, it, we had a lot of fun. So this year we're going to belgium so we were like yeah let's visit each other's home countries and just dive a lot of mines and caves cool. um so we're going to belgium this year in june and i mean anyone can join actually so it's not um it's not like um it's not exclusive for, just exclusive just for women but of course we encourage yeah. women to come along and then it's it, we're not how to say packaging trips like 
um, we're not selling trips or something yeah. like that. Or you just you want to come, you come, you you pay for it. We're all paying our own. So it's just like a group of mates messy. deciding to go together. Yeah, yeah, a group of cans <laughs> coming together <laughs> to dive. <laughs> Re- yeah, rebreather or OC or whatever. Yeah. Um, Wicked. Yeah, so we had a we had a lot of fun and everyone is and it's really nice to see like different rebreathers because in Sweden it's very like JJ dominated. But here we were seeing like XCCRs and Kiss Machines and stuff yeah. like that, Liberties. So I like it. Mm. It's more diverse in that sense. Uh, Maria was on that um, Zuna Han expedition a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, or a couple yeah. Weeks ago, weren't you? How did she do with that? Have you any idea? Did they, did they discover the pathway to enlightenment I mean, or whatever they were looking I, for? I, I don't know. I, hadn't, I didn't have a lot of time to actually speak to her about it. Um, yeah. you, should, you should definitely get her on this podcast and, and she can ex- describe yeah. everything because because it sounded like it was fucking amazing it looked like yeah. that from the photos well, i spoke to ramva big... i had ramva on mm-hmm. on the first season um she works for shearwater and for fourth element yeah so she that was in the build-up to it so i had a good chat with her and then i i i, I did attempt actually to get maria on and she ignored me so <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'll, no! leave it. I'll leave it there ghosted <laughs> Oh, well, you, yeah. I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. You know, if, if people want to come on here, they'll come on. If they don't and don't listen, whatever. It is, I'm easy, me. Hmm. Yeah. So so what plans have you got while, you, while you're while you where you are now? Because you, you're away on holiday, aren't you? Vacationing. <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of a lot of things in the pipeline, a lot of what ifs and stuff like that. So um, go back to Tinehaspe for sure, the closest. And then um, also... We're doing, yeah, I'm, I'm actually getting a new machine as well. So right now, yeah, I know. <laughs> what face are you um, making? <laughs> why, why, what's up with your JJ? No, the, the, the JJ is, is, is fine. It works fine. But? Uh, but, but, here's the but, and it's a, it's a small but. Um, it's a bit too... Uh, big for me. All right. I'm only 157 centimeters, and uh, I have installed like you know the shorter frame that they have, yeah. uh, or the shorter uh, steel stand that they actually have to the extended range frame one on right. my regular one to get it to come a bit shorter, but it's still a bit too long. I have I have some issues just just relating to the fact that I have short arms on the machine. Uh, that for me kind of hinders me from doing deeper dives just okay. because of the way I reach stage tanks or how I reach uh, valves and stuff like that. I don't want it to be, I want it to go like flawlessly. I don't yeah. want it to be uh, hindered by my size. So I'm getting a new one. Yes. Um, and then, so the course for that one is, also in the pipeline it all depends on the corona like where where i can fly yeah. where can i get an instructor um how long will it take for the machine to arrive and blah 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 but that's the biggest change i think for me this year and it's actually wow. quite nice to 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 learn a new machine i think well, you're getting, uh, you getting I, a meg uh no i'm not getting a meg i'm getting a revo all right yeah because it you can have that in a very tiny size so yeah. that's where I'm, i know a few, a few girls with. that i've dived with or trained with that have gone mm. for the what's what's it called? The it's not the mini, is it? The micro. Micro. The micro. Yeah, the micro one is the smallest one. But it's right. also very nice because it's very flat. So the yeah. JJ builds a lot on the back. So if you want to do like tighter caves or mines, it's right. the the JJ won't take you so far. And it it wasn't really. I don't think it was really designed to be like this ultra cave expedition machine. Obviously, because it's quite large. Um, and that sounds the Revo is better. Right. So I'm getting mm-hmm. that one. Interesting. Are you going to keep your JJ or are you going to flog it, get rid? Um, I will keep it for a little while, I think. Because um, I'm, I'm going to sell it. Um, I'm selling it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so it depends on the overlap oh, and so, stuff like that. So but we're no, not, we're it not will be, leave. We're not going to be JJ friends anymore. Got it. No. Friendship over. <laughs> no more podcasts. <laughs> who was that? Wo- who was that woman? Delete. 
<laughs> unfollowed. No one unfollow, no no block. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> block. Yeah, but the, no, but I I like the JJ is fine. I just wish it was smaller. Yeah. But I mean, it wasn't designed for people who are below 160. It wasn't really designed, I think, for people who are above 180 either, but or mm. 190, but at least they can reach everything. <laughs> Yeah, I think the only the problem machine. I've got, when I put it on, I'll adjust the harness correctly, but I still feel a pull on my chest here, you know, over my shoulders. Mm-hmm. So I have adjusted it to what, how I would adjust like a backpack or, or any other harness. And I've always dived a one-piece harness, so the fact that I can adjust it off the shoulders and off the waist, yeah. I don't know whether it's just wrong. So I've, I've added a chest strap, certainly for the carry between the car and the water's edge, whether I need it in the water or not. I've never felt it uncomfortable in the water. It's always on the carry. Um, but I'm only 165, so I'm not a lot taller than you, but I'm certainly not in a 180 plus range. So maybe it's just not sat on my hips in the way that it should be to to not pull across yeah. my shoulders. Yeah, know. maybe. So uh, if you if you if you read the JJCCR manual, they they do have like a uh, like a picture, like how it should look like when the machine is on you. Or, or how uh, and how it should not look like. Um, <clears throat> it might be that you may have the same problem as me, like when, when I have the full scale machine on me, like the, ah, oh, you have it there, you have the manual, <laughs> you nerd, you have it printed <laughs> out. Oh my yeah. Lord, nerd alert. <laughs> no, it's actually quite good, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to, I have, no. I have a downloaded PDF. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to lie, I've got a friend who has a print shop and I do him a, one favour a year and he does me a d- loads. So whenever I need any printing, I just say, Steve, can you print this? Another Steve. It's like, all oh, I've got Steve's in my life. And he said, <laughs> and he prints it's it out for me. But I like I like to be touchy-feely. So I've got this out on my bench. I can yeah. just look at it. And I'm not, you know, it's I, I, maybe because that's how I was brought up. I'm, I'm like 42 nearly. So I'm used to having hard books, aren't I? Not used to technology. Whilst I can use it, I much prefer having something I can look at and, and touch and flick through and flick back dead easily. And Yeah, there yeah. you go. The, correct. The, there, there it is. Correct yes, exactly. And incorrect. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I, I look through the manual a lot a lot as well when, I, when yeah. I, um, I'm hesitant on the, anything on the machine. But for me, like... <clears throat> When I had the machine and, and I have the, the longer frame or the longer steel stand, like when I'm on land, the, the machine ends below my ass, basically. So it covers me from the neck to below my ass. That, wow. That's how, how, how long it is for me. And, yeah. and, um, and here in Sweden, it's not been, no one's really ever said anything. And I've been like, yeah, but, well, this is the machine I have. And I, I, I like I can't, I can't use my height as an excuse to 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 not know my shit. So I just have to train harder and just get 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 on it. And and no one has really t- said to me like maybe that machine is not the right size for you. Uh, but then this year I've been out a lot more, and there's been more foreign divers that've been to Sweden as well. <laughs> and they all just take a look at me and they're like, "How are you diving that huge machine?" Like when I was in, we were in Germany and we were diving this mine called Nutlar. And um, we were we're doing it like we were. It wasn't supposed to be a traverse. We were diving from one place to another place, and then we were gonna dive mm. back. But because it's very shallow, my ears just didn't wanna didn't wanna do anything. So I was like, oh, okay. Well, I have to I have to get up here, and then I have to walk out. So I had to climb out of the the mine. It was like I think 150 or 200 meters, wow. <laughs> and I was climbing. I was getting really dirty on my. I was like, oh no, my dry suit is getting dirty, and and up and down, and then just well, out the whole way. And I had the, the owner accompany me, just help me on the really high, like holding the ladders and stuff. And, and well, then we got up and he was like, I, I, I can't believe that you, you climbed and you walked all that way with that huge machine of yours. I was like, yeah, but I have to. <laughs> I have to because I can't carry it with my arms. I'm too weak, yeah. but I can carry it on my back. Um, so it's just like, it may, maybe it's time. Yeah, <laughs> to get something. Uh, a bit smaller so but it's been fine the function is fine like yeah. i have i have no complaints the only thing i don't like on the machine is that um you know the 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 head and the accumulation of silt in the o-rings that's the yeah. 
one of the biggest downsides i think to the the design of the machine now like i'm yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm not i'm not an engineer so i'm not gonna i'm not <laughs> i don't want to criticize it too much because i don't have a good option <laughs> to yeah. how you would do otherwise do it so i'm not gonna sit here and criticize but it is it, it is one of the i don't have to say more trickier parts of the machine i think because mm. because the head uh, it stops all the silt but the water continues out of the little hole where you have the little button for the head yeah so it's kind of like a um yeah water just, can flow through and it just gets carried yeah in but the, but the yeah but the silt is not and it's just getting yeah. stuck to the o-rings so one of the bad things about that is if you have a lot of the silt um and it, it and it it doesn't have to be you moving through the water i was just laying on the surface at one point and there was a lot of silt on the surface when we're doing a photo shoot and i still got a lot of shit around my o-rings and um the bad part about that is every time you have to pull up the head the o-rings will scratch against the silt so so at one point i had to get help to get out the machine because there was so much rust yeah. um so and then your you cave shield the do you always have your cave shield on um i have only the cave shield on when i do overhead dives right. so and the, and the cave shield doesn't stop the silt it's not one of those um you can see at not at 90 one of those round covers that actually well, um, I've got no, one. It's just... I got one from the the red, is it red shack or red hut? You know the scapa scuba, the big red, yeah, old life bottles. They make them. So when I was in there, just going for a, a quick wander around, I saw one. I said, right, I'm good. while I'm here and I can get one, I'll have one. And I do like it, but I think what it leaves you open to is thinking that your head's fitted, because you you never put your head all the way in when it's dry, like when you've when it's in storage. You mm -hmm. leave it so it's sat on that button. And if you don't push it in properly, it's not going to seal. And I, I've yeah. been guilty of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, but the cave shield, I only use it when I do the overhead dives. So when right. I wreck dive or something like that, I don't have the, I don't have the cave shield. Um, so the cave shield for me, because um, the obvious, the obvious um, usage for that cave shield is to um, protect the, machine from from scraping or whatever but the truth is um when i dive there's nowhere really that tight where i have to actually worry about scraping the machine if i maybe if i'm scootering and i lose track of where the ceiling is or i'm too close then you might scratch it yes but otherwise the boys wise i don't spend a lot of time hitting the roof or how to say with the with the machine um, the, the 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 usage I have for it is more related to weight because it distributes more weight in the front of the machine rather than yeah. in the back, um, which is what I want when I'm when I'm in the when I'm when I'm, yeah because so I don't get too uh, back heavy, yeah. um, so it it because it's thicker in the front than in in the back. Um, the second part is that it's. I don't know really when I would ever have a usage of that, but it's disposable weight. I can take it off my machine and throw it away to make myself lighter if I would ever be in a situation where something like that would be needed. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the third part is that um, that uh, cave shield can also act as a shovel if I ever need to dig my way out or like a, like a pry bar. Yeah. So, so for me, people, People might be looking at me and just going like, "Oh, she's so vain. She doesn't want to protect. She doesn't want to scratch her machine." Yeah, that's true. I don't. <laughs> I don't want to scratch my machine. But there's also other uses for that machine as well. You just have to use uh, use your imagination. Mm -hmm. I never thought of digging myself out of anywhere. I don't fancy it either. So, uh, my, no, my maybe... cave diving. No, <laughs> not for now. <laughs> well, I mean, to 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 be honest like if there would be some kind of cave in the mind i don't think really maybe the cave sheet is gonna help me um Couple of just hand because grenades, of them right? yeah I, yeah it's probably lights out at that point depending on like if there's any other way out or if it's just um tons and tons of rocks hmm. so well that's a whole other it, podcast so oh <laughs> uh, yeah for sure for sure so yeah but the cave shield doesn't protect against silt no. It really does. It protects against scratches. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, well, thanks for coming on, mate. It's been uh, this time to see you. has made it 
twice as pleasurable <laughs> as last time. Oh, thank you. I, I was okay, I was joking with some people saying that uh, I'm the I'm the Sia of the diving world. Like no one has seen my <laughs> face. Um, <laughs> Um, because usually on my Instagram, I just, I don't really post a lot of pictures on me, like where you can actually yeah. see my naked face. Usually it's a mask yeah. and a loop and blah, blah, blah. And I've got some comments or like people are like, oh, can't you show me a picture of your face? I'm like, why? <laughs> <laughs> why, why do you want to see my face? It's not about my face. <laughs> it's about my diving. I think um, even, even on last year, the picture I've got on, on the little thumbnail, it's you, the person, yeah, yeah. aviators on with your looping. Yeah. So you can, can't even tell who you are. Anyway, I could walk past you, you wouldn't know. Yeah, yeah it, is, it could actually not be me, even. It could actually be someone else. <laughs> Ace. So uh, yeah. anyway, you, so you're going to have to send me a picture to put on the thumbnail now. I, I might just use this one where you've got this red hue, oh, the, the, red tones. The, the, the porno diver specialty, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, this is horrendous. Oh, yes, you're going to have to, gonna ma have Mark, to This is explicit. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so you have to. Yeah, you have to have the little e thingy that they have next to Spotify, and then you have to bleep out all the count words. <laughs> Sarah Bandavi X X X X. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, mate, thanks sounds, for coming on. So, yeah, I've had a right laugh. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's well, you, you kind of need it. <laughs> you yeah, need to absolutely. laugh a bit as well. So I, I hope, I hope the things I've, I hope that some of the things <laughs> I've said. <laughs> make some sense or that you know some people can learn from it or whatever so, and i'm always open to people like people might not know this but i'm always really open to people writing to me asking yeah. me stuff or or just telling me i'm suck i can take it <laughs> <laughs> bring it <laughs> how can they find you then what 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 names and stuff do you go under on your instagram and that uh it's just this my name sara sara van Der i'm not very <laughs> imaginative <laughs> So yeah, you went yeah. all out on that one. Yeah, just and then are you sitting down? Just, is it is it just the K vets or is it at K vets? I forget now. I've uh, not it's, it down. Uh, um, it's the K vets, uh, the the, the K vets. So yeah, well, I'll put I'll, I'll put all the links in the description after on on YouTube it's, and the um, the podcast sites and that. So if anyone wants to touch base with you, oh, I hate that phrase. <laughs> if anyone wants to touch like base. have a chat, what does that even mean? Especially Touching when you base. said before you get a load of shit around your O-ring. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Do you? I'll, I'll never. <laughs> oh my God. This is going to, to hidden depths of like innuendo here now. It's horrendous. Right, I'm going. <laughs> I'm going before it gets worse. <laughs> yes, because I was like, touching base? You mean like third base or second base? I don't know. I don't play baseball. <laughs> oh, no. I know. I ruined it. <laughs> It's going to take so much editing to clean this up. I'll I'll just not bother. Yeah. I'll just put it out of filth. Yeah, it's going to be like yeah. So we we're recording one and a half hours, and I got twenty minutes of material. <laughs> Ace. Right, mate. It's well, good. thanks very much. I'll uh, I'll no doubt I'll speak to you yes. again soon enough. Let me know how you get on with that Revo, and maybe maybe if I do series four, we'll have a chat about your Revo. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, that would be actually uh, quite fun, and I hope I get to see you in person sometime doing yeah, some awesome fun. dives or something. Yeah, yeah. I'll join the K vets, awesome. mate. Whenever, you, whenever you're next over nearest us, and the Rona has disappeared, maybe we can hook up. Yeah, but you'll probably sure. intimidate me with your your diving prowess. Now I've I've just got to like fifty hours, and don't I... don't be. I I look like shit in the water. It's it's no big deal. <laughs> It's a miracle I haven't died yet. <laughs> right, well, if, if you get fine. round to it, send us, a, send us a picture, a decent one where I can see your head. And, uh... <laughs> a decent one? Shit. Yeah. Go take one now I'm in the effort. snow, like that. Psh, selfie and get it pinged over. I'm going to go get right. some breakfast. Thanks again, mate. Have a nice holiday. See you later. So that brings us to the end of the episode and I hope you've enjoyed this week's guest enough to subscribe to the Fancy Brew podcast and leave us a five-star review wherever you download your podcasts. Don't forget to take a look at Dive Life's website and social media channels as they always have some great deals available and you can use promo code ATND10 at the checkout to get some money off any non-discounted items. For more information on this episode, take a look at the description or follow us on Instagram for all the latest news and upcoming releases. Thanks for listening. I'll see you on the next one.